All right, welcome to GAFCON 3 and the behind the scenes, the commentary about what's happening uh, because you keep emailing and asking. And yes, we know what's happening, so we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, first, I want to talk about the atmosphere. The atmosphere here is uh, certainly uh, different, um, a little less chaotic, and it shows a, a mature organization. Uh, you know, for crying out loud, the comms team alone is doing a, a very professional job. Uh, the site is great and communications is doing well. George, what have you seen? You, I, can, you can hold. We have one little microphone we're going to share. This is just for you guys out there. I so you brought the cat with you. No, it's not the cat. <laughs> well, was it, uh, Gavin, you correct me, was it Tolstoy who said that all happy families are alike and not each unhappy family is different? I don't know him or, or Dostoevsky. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I think he's right. So one of those. <laughs> On one level, the surface level, this is a happy family. It's a very happy family. There's a degree... You don't hold the mic very often. There you go. It, there no. is a... No, how do I do that? You do it just fine. <laughs> there is a degree of enthusiasm, of joy, of fellowship. You walk through the crowds. You see the people. There's no hesitation. Strangers greet strangers. There's a real positive sense of Christian fellowship and love. On that level, on the macro level... There's not much to say because all happy families are alike and that I really do feel God's spirit moving amongst people. But you don't want to hear that. You want to hear all the unhappy family <laughs> stuff. What's unique about this? Gavin, what have you witnessed as far as uh, this GAFCON? The good stuff. Well, the good stuff is just as George has said. It's, it's a relief to be able to be part of uh, an Anglican coming together where uh, there is no hesitation, no embarrassment, no confusion. No sidestepping, no slipperiness, just uh, a, a, a joyful, open commitment to the reality of the gospel. Um, it's a wonderful. And, and actually, one of the things I think that I've been very impressed by is the quality of the people who've been speaking. So um, Archbishop Oko is magisterial. Um, Michael Nazi Ali is magisterial. We're very lucky to have them and other people of that intellectual and spiritual caliber, because you don't often get those two things together. People are often either clever and not very, not very open to the hiddenness of the kingdom, or they're open to the hiddenness of the kingdom and, and they don't articulate it with the clarity that it deserves. But in these men, we have both together, and it's a very and powerful combination. I want to j jump in there, Gavin, because you're being modest, but not only does this have headliners that uh, at most of our viewers, who they would recognize their names, Michael Nazar Ali, Archbishop Oko, the, there is depth because we just don't have a single plenary each day. We have a morning Bible exposition and then we have the plenary session. We often have follow-ups and then in the afternoons, if we're not out touring the countryside, we have presentations. And the degree of uh, uh, expertise and knowledge and diversity in these presentations is fantastic. The opening Bible study was done by Dr. Alfred Olwa from the Diocese of Longo in Uganda. This man could teach at any American seminary and he could be on TV. He's entertaining and intelligent. And he's young. I'm very jealous of this guy. He's not thin, so there's not a total loss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not total jealousy. <laughs> but Gavin is going to be one of uh, the pre... You're going on this afternoon, are you not? Yes, I'm doing a presentation with, with Melvin Tinker on, on a... On, I mean, I would say this, but it is true. Uh, on an enormously important topic. It's about cultural Marxism. And people say, well, you know, this sounds a bit esoteric. But what we're really doing is we're doing an expose of the, of the secular culture that we're surrounded by and that in England, certainly, and, and in America to some extent, the church is drowning in. And unless we're able to articulate what it is, it, you, you can't fight an enemy that you don't see and, un, and understand and whose tactics you can't make sense of. So the splendid Melvin Tinker, who has write, has written a book on it and I, are going to be exploring the implications of that for the church in the West. And I'm going to pull this back from you. Uh, <laughs> we're going to be fighting for the mic, and poor Kevin is going to be <laughs> back and forth across the thing. And, it, and it's not Western-focused only. Uh, at the same, um, there, have, there, there are African-led uh, discussion groups on witchcraft, which and the demonic and the spirit world and animism are live issues. There's a uh, uh, class on dealing with militant Buddhism. Now, if you're from Myanmar, that may not be an issue in Tunbridge Wells. But if you live in Sri Lanka, if you live in Myanmar, the, the uh, 
interaction with Buddhism, with, Buddha, with Milton Buddhism, is a vital concern, and that depth is there. <laughs> George, it is an issue in Tunbridge Wells. It, I'm here to tell you. Buddhism. Well, the, the, well, this is uh, the mute button right here. <laughs> I'll let you guys uh, you know, decide when to mute it. Well, yes, of course, because, <laughs> because the, the, the basics of a kind of consumeristic Buddhism have slipped into the bourgeois lives. It is a kind of almost a lingua franca, a bourgeois uh, spirituality in Tunbridge Wells. And I have to say that uh, the, the demonic is not restricted to witchcraft in Africa. It's very much a live issue in Tunbridge Wells and the rest of England too. Here comes the cat. <laughs> now, what about Isha? I want to know how we're doing there. I mean, okay. how's Hold the diocese of uh, Guildford, Guildford doing? Right. I mean, are they uh, over, overrun by uh, men in saffron robes yeah. walking about? Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between this Gafcon and other Gafcons. Mm -hmm. And that's the relationship with the Church of England, or its homage to Canterbury. Uh, before, you'd see a videotape or an in-person visit from Justin Welby, and we would allow for that. But now, there's almost, we're going to go it alone. We don't need the boss. And, you know, I've noticed it. Have you guys noticed it? I'll let the guy from England say first. Oh, there you go. Past Gafcons, <laughs> there have either been, as you say, video presentations or these sort of weedy men with big Adam's apples wearing socks and sandals from the Archbishop's office hanging around in the back. <laughs> Nobody's like that here. No. Uh, we have a large English contingent, but the save for three bishops that I'm aware of, Keith Sinclair, Rod Thomas, and the retired Michael Nazarali, the establishment is not here. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, uh, the last time we met together at Nairobi, the Archbishop of Canterbury flew in, I think at the last minute, and preached a sermon in Nairobi. It was marked for its dislocation from what was actually going on. But the fact was, he, he was there. There was still some sense that we were doing Anglicanism together, and that's changed. Uh, we're yet to see whether or not in uh, any public statement there's going to be a, a breach, an official breach in the communion uh, but there's certainly an unofficial breach in one, and I think one of the things that's happening now is that Orthodox Anglicans uh, are, are growing in their sense of perception that, this is, that their separation from the office of the Archbishop of Canterbury and from the establishment, certainly in England, is, is not one of, of gradual moving away with a, the, the, the tension of being stretched, but actually of, of, of sheer and complete cleavage. We are doing two different Gospels, two different kinds of church, I'm afraid two different kinds of God. Now, the Archbishop Welby called GAFCON a ginger group. I'm here with the largest gathering of uh, Anglicans in 75 years. Is, now, it, is it a ginger group he can continue to ignore? Well, I, I think that's a Trump, I think that's an George English, the cat, I think that's an English mannerism because if He's you said so a ginger group, I would think, you know, we're all little Donald Trump uh, f uh, fanciers all with orange <laughs> hair and everything. What is a ginger group? What did he mean by that? Well, he was trying to be rude. I mean, this is, this is part of English code language. Um, when you want to be extremely and offensively rude, you do it in a, with a very subtle understatement. And this subtle understatement of the ginger group was as <laughs> intended to be as offensive as possible, saying really that the, this group has no lock of standing, no integrity, no, no voice, and no judgment. It's just a, a, a small uh, informal gathering of people muttering to themselves about things that interest them. It was, it was uh, intended to be offensive, of course, and it is a, a huge misunderstanding a deliberate misunderstanding of one of the most powerful groups of Anglicanism that has emerged ever. I, I'll uh, argue with you on one point that you made, Gavin, not about gender groups. Um, there has been a breach. It's not official. It's not legalistic. It's not been encoded in a resolution or a legislative act. And frankly, I don't think they're going to bother with that. Hmm. But the the straightforward, clear theological implications of statements by Nicholas Oko in his presidential address, um, by uh, Stanley Ntigali in his comments about Uganda. I think my, my understanding of what's going on is that the, they don't want to play the English games anymore. They don't want to play the little, this, this is a parliamentary procedure sort of thing. Uh, Nicholas Oko was quite clear that this is an issue of uh, life and death, salvation or damnation. And those who 
distort the gospel, to meld it to the culture around them, are going not to see the kingdom of God or heaven or paradise. So essentially, he's saying Justin Welby's going to go to hell unless he repents. So whether or not you issue a statement that we affirm or not affirm or we're in Canterbury or out, that's rather second string compared to the fact that Justin Welby's going to hell. <laughs> I'm afraid to do this, but <laughs> don't tell me he's going to hell. <laughs> well, George, you're right, but I still think that's only part of the story. The difficulty in England um, is that so many people have yet to wake up and get what's going on. Uh, this, is, this is the great surprise for many of us, that uh, it, clearly it's about spiritual discernment and, and, and clarity, but there are a great many people who are in two minds about the integrity of the present direction of the Church of England, and they're desperate to give it the benefit of the doubt. Uh, did they do so for very good reasons and, and sometimes for poor reasons? The good reasons are that to give up on something as honourable and as ancient as the Church of England would, would be a, an immensely painful thing to do. The bad reasons are there is an element of, of comfort and personal uh, co convenience in, in, in inhabiting the Church of England. But uh, my view, um, uh, Archbishop, if you're listening, <laughs> is that in order to help people with their rather sleepy discernment of what's going on, there needs to, to be a, a clearer articulation. Um, institutionally isn't quite the right word, but pragmatically about what the implications are of Archbishop Oko's statement. He said wonderfully clearly that if you don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you preach another gospel, you're in danger of going to hell. I think there needs to be some clearer um, expression of that in, uh, pragmatically in terms of understanding the relationship between the two Anglicanisms that we have in England, certainly, and, and wider. The Anglicanism of, of well, I, I've, I've heard it called sexualized uh, hedonistic extensionism essentially uh, a Christianity defined by a wholly unchristian awareness of one's romantic and sexualized attractions, unconstrained by the normal conventions of moral behavior. This is such a, this is such a departure from the centuries-old gospel-ordered Christianity that there needs to be some clearer expression that it's a different religion. I kind of want to move on to another topic. Well, can I just close... You're closing me down, and right, so I'll close down the top. Okay. I, think, I think, though, uh, for our viewers, we need to realize this is not a bash Justin Welby gathering. No, but I'm looking, and his face is really red. <laughs> the Archbishop of Nigeria in his presidential address spoke about materialism, hedonism, uh, conformity to the world around it. He talked about witchcraft in Africa. He talked about the threat of syncretism in, in Asia. Uh, he listed uh, all the ills plaguing societies and churches around the world, but the common solution to each of those ills was salvation in Jesus Christ, in Christ alone. And I think, so please don't hear that this is, I don't want people to close their ears to think, oh, this is just English bashing, which is fun, but it's not why this conference is here. No, but, but, but I was giving the English perspective oh, yeah. on, on the global uh, dimensions that but, you quite rightly articulated. But the English not, deserve it, so it's not. fire, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We're not doing crossfire. <laughs> Next topic. Now, the implications of what happens in the communion in a small place like South Sudan have many applications all the way to America. You represent Anglo-Catholics, Anglican evangelical. Well, I, I'd say uh, sacramentalists. Is it... We need to get the technicalities wrong. Oh, and, I rep and I represent the right sort of Episcopal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm somewhere in the middle. It's like Ghostbusters. Don't cross the streams. You know, like, <laughs> but, you know, in, in reality, um, there's people here that are not here because of what happened in South Sudan when they uh, consecrated a female bishop uh, earlier last year, late last year. Um, what does that mean? in the greater uh, scheme of things. We don't respect the uh, Anglo-Catholics, or we can't say sorry, or there's just some things we can't. Some bridges are too far. This is uh, an error of management at the very top, as I believe it. Uh, in a year ago, December 2016, Daniel Dengbull, the then primate of South Sudan, consecrated a woman, assistant bishop Rumbeck, and her name escapes me. That's right. And it, 
Elizabeth, yes, Bishop Elizabeth, and we only, I found out after having asked for a year, and I found out because looking at a Facebook post of a friend, there's this woman in a purple shirt and a skirt at, an, at a House of Bishops and, meeting. And a very big pink handbag. And a pink handbag, yes. <laughs> and you, you eliminate Roman Catholic quick, and then you go, certainly not Anglican. And they're not Episcopalian, so there was no cross-dressing. <laughs> no. So. so the primates knew about this, but didn't say anything. And when this became public through the machinations of uh, Manny, Mo, and Jack here, the Anglo-Catholics, particularly in the United States, were livid because uh, the, um, Gavin, what's the phrase? The moratorium. Moratorium, but also the efficacy or indelibility of order. In other words, why, can't, why a woman couldn't be a bishop because she couldn't be, why can't she be a bishop in that worldview? Well, Keep there, it short. There are Keep two ways short. of doing Anglicanism. There's, 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 there's function and ontology. So the, the evangelical end, ministry is about function, but at the Anglo-Catholic or the sacramental end, it's actually about ontology. Um, God is father. He's not mother. He's, he's, he's not trans, uh, trans. So the fatherhood of God and the way that which that's expressed in the orders of the church is actually critical to the, to the, to the truth of the church. It's always been the Catholic view that if you change that, uh, you open a door to something really quite, quite terrible. And for many people, the door that's been opened by the feminization of orders leads straight to gay marriage and the transgender. It, there's an unbroken line. So uh, even at the functional level, it's hard to deny that, 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 that experimenting with gender in orders has led to where we are now. But at the ontological level, it's actually impossible. All right, hold on. Hold on. People out there want to know who's not here. Yeah. We, we hint, or you're going you're gonna to tell them? Or you no, no, tell you, tell, no, you tell them. It's your turn. All right, well, okay. It's your Thank camera you. and your microphone. <laughs> All right, now we know what's going on here. I, you know, I, I've written the checks. I flew you guys out here. They're going to let me Mrs. talk for Carlson two minutes. Mrs. wrote the checks. No, <laughs> They're going to let me fair. talk for, okay. Thank you, Be dear. fair. We're Thank watching. you, Joe. Yeah, what are we doing here? Okay. So uh, Bishop um, Keith Ackerman did not come, and he, uh, we were told he didn't come because he's unhappy with the South Sudan situation. Bishop Ingel Fritz is not here, and we were told we can assume he didn't come for the same reason. Um, who's uh, his assistant? Uh... Uh, folks, I had four hours of sleep. Yeah, we're, stuff, we're in a different like time minute. zone, but uh, his assistant didn't come either. Um, you know, Forward and Faith is not here, and that's, uh, that's big. The three or four delegates from Fort Microphone, Worth. Microphone. Oops, yeah. There are three or four delegates from Fort Worth, for instance, yeah. uh, whereas there was a much bigger contingent last time. Now, for those who are not uh, exercised by this issue, some people may think, well, that's just pure spite. They're being childish. Um, but if, if you truly believe in the, even if you partially believe, <laughs> in the uh, understanding of the doctrine of the church that Gavin, Gavin has spoken of, it is better not to come to a party and throw a fit because there's a woman vesting as a bishop and you will process in with her when you can't recognize her validity. It's better not to show. Well, that was <clears throat> a big point is nobody knew if she was going to show. Mm -hmm. Now, I confirmed today that she's not here uh, with the communication office, but that would have been a fear of certainly of Bishop Ackerman and Bishop Inglefitz, you know, what's going on here? We have to say that she's undoubtedly, we don't know her, but, but, but clearly she has the confidence of a church. Mm -hmm. She must be a really first-rate Christian woman. Absolutely. Exercising a first-rate Christian ministry. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to do with her. Uh, it's to do with the fact that Anglicanism um, is a combination of, of uh, spiritual virtues. Um, a bishop in, in England surprised me once, an Anglo-Catholic bishop, when he said, as, as our synod made these changes, Anglicanism is an ecumenical experiment that just failed. Um, for as long as the orders that have existed for 2,000 years are kept in place by Anglicanism, it hasn't failed. If you change the orders, it's something else. And so you're inviting people to a party to which they no longer belong. And of course, that would include me too. Okay, we've complained a little bit about the overturning of primates, re-elections, and um, all of a sudden their office is now occupied by a more liberal person who doesn't want to be part of GAFCON. They're trying to set up new structures um, in order to take care of this. So I haven't heard any uh, bylaws being passed at a provincial level, but they're trying to have that, that more stuff backup. That should come out on Friday yeah. because they have committees working in the background. Well, let's talk a good about good friend the of the show, background. Stephen Knoll, for sure. instance, is lead, 
he may, uh, he's on the uh, drafting committee for the communique, and he's involved in setting up, if you will, the back office mm -hmm. operations of a global movement. See, right now, Peter Jensen doesn't have an office staff in Sydney. He has to rely upon the good graces of the Diocese of Sydney to do his communications and buy his stamps and stuff. Mm -hmm. And how can you run an organization that claims to represent 71% of the active Anglicans in the world out of your office study at home? It, yeah, it, I mean, that's one of the problems. You got something you want to... You no, that was good. good. No, oh, no, no, I'll, okay, yeah. I'll keep quiet till I've got something worth saying. Okay, well, we should <laughs> probably... You, we want to do another episode tomorrow and Friday. Um, people, why don't you put one out Monday? Well, there's no news on Monday. Tuesday, we did tours and stuff like that. This is the first day that we could sit down and talk about some news. Anything else you want to finish up with? Yeah, I really want to make uh, encourage people to look... There's We're some of the this. smaller differences. This is a really polished professional show. Um, mature. It, no, well, we could say that those operating it have matured. Three times is the charm. <laughs> Three times is right. The, everything from the catering to the communications to the venues, it works. It's done much more effectively and efficiently than I've been to uh, seven general conventions which are about the same size. I've been to two Lambeth conferences. None of those compare to the seamless and smoothness of this particular operation. And, there's, and that, I think, speaks of the confidence of this organization. They're, no, they're not hiding anything from me that I'm aware of because they are so confident that they're happy for you to know of the, okay, here's the Anglo-Catholics are a little, they have this upset here and this is happening over there. In other words, there's no degree to twist or, or be secretive or to manipulate us. No, and that was exactly apparent with uh, the uh, Keith Ackerman issue. We're not going to hide from this. He's not here because of this reason. And they said the same about Inglefitz. I mean, we're not going to hide behind these issues. We're going to be upfront about it, which is cool. And that shows me a maturity uh, that I didn't see in GAFCON 1 and 2. When we left GAFCON 2, there was a bit of chaos, you know, as to what the message was going to be, how they were going to uh, put a uh, people into England and start that up, which we'll talk about in tomorrow's episode. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about yet is the embargoed information, because this isn't going out till 4, we can talk about it. All right. All right. He's English, isn't he? For wrong? No, he's Nigerian. No. Uh, Josiah, <laughs> Adai, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> Josiah, Josiah Daiwa Faron, former Nigerian <clears throat> bishop, who was friends. Remember this: he's not an archbishop. He was voted out of that office. It's like if you were a general and then demoted to colonel on your retirement. You don't go around with your having the word general on your business card. Bishop Daiwa Faron, or Doctor Daiwa Faron, if we don't want to enter that point. ACC, ACC General Secretary wrote to the primates individually with the same circular letter saying, don't come. Don't have anything to do with GAFCON. They are, it's, he said something, nothing new that he has said For He has said that GAFCON is the work of the devil. It seeks to destroy and divide the church. And basically what he did this time was uh, to try to put the screws on to tell those on the fence not to come. And guess what? It worked. They came. Well, no, no. There's a bishop of Tanz uh, Archbishop of Tanzania who's now here. No, he's here. He's listed. And uh, he's, there are. Th he's, he's now unlisted. He's now unlisted. Yeah. Okay. Well, the Archbishop of the Indian Ocean, James Wong of the Seychelles. Sure. He's here. Yeah. Uh, but there was a concerted effort from London sure. to kill this conference. Absolutely. <clears throat> are they afraid? In London? I was going to say oh, that. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> well, of course, you have to set this aside, set this by the side of it being called a ginger group. So on the one hand, there's an attempt to deprive the conference of any, any publicity. And I have to say, it has no publicity at all in England. And, yeah. uh, and on the other hand, um, not in demeaning it and depriving it of publicity, but an attempt to spike it. Well, that must mean that they're, they're very concerned that, the, that what we're doing here has some power and integrity. And and it, it, it challenges, um, well, it challenges their, their, their own position. And, and, and so it should, and let's hope it's successful. Can I 
Sure. I, I know we it's limited time, and yeah. I know you're hungry. I well, hear your stomach. Do you hear that? It's beeping. It's, My stomach is it's beeping. It's usually because we're <laughs> separated by 1,200 miles. I can't hear those rumblings. Rumblings beep. Well, I view this as almost like a parish gathering. This is a happy, successful parish. But within the parish, you have different people at different places in their faith cycle, in their life cycle, in their wealth cycle. The ACNA is having a ball here. Yeah, they have right. survived. They have prospered. The Sydney people, they're over their financial woes of the past. They know what they stand for. There's great many churches here that are just thriving, and so they bring that energy and enthusiasm. We have Tanzanians here, and as you and I, Kevin, have reported, the Tanzanians are in perpetual crisis. Yes. And oh. so we have individual Tanzanians. They're people from 53 nations around the world. Not all the churches are doing... Who's the saddest people? Well, that's the topic of our next episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good closing. <laughs> I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Can I have the camera? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and I'm Gavin Ashenden. This is episode 409. Of oh, Ang oh. <laughs> we're so good at this. Of Anglican, unscripted. Oh.